All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another virtual shadowing session here at Hearts for Health. Today, we're honored to be joined by Dr. Patiski. To quickly introduce him, he's a pediatric nephrologist and a clinician educator at heart. He's educated and engaged with pre-health students, just like ourselves, as the executive director of pre-health advising at Emory University and the director of the pediatric hypertension program at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. We're really excited to hear about the field of pediatric nephrology. <clears throat> it's not one that we've covered so far, and pediatrics, I understand, is a really, um, really a field of enthusiasm for a lot of students listening in. So we're really excited to hear your insights. And also, um, having had experience with advising, we'd love to also hear about that. So that's just a little about Dr. Patiski. Um, for a few reminders for those listening in, th those who are new to the general format of virtual shadowing, we, uh, we have speakers with different specialties and you are free to ask any questions, whether it be for the specialty, about their journey, um, whatever it might be around the specific topic that we're covering today. Um, you can include your questions in the, the chat box uh, and we'll read out them throughout the session um, and, and we'll be able to get questions answered then. So post your questions in the chat box and we'll be able to cover them throughout. If you wanna stay updated with future shadowing sessions, just like this one, we post them or we live stream them, I should say, weekly on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, you can keep in tune with that by just checking our uh, YouTube page at those times. We post the flyers on Instagram and also over our email listserv. So those are two ways you can stay in tune ahead of time with upcoming shadowing sessions. I think that's really all. Um, to be added onto our listserv, just one more thing, you can either email us at shadowing, period h, the number 4h at gmail.com, or just subscribe at the bottom of our website. We have a subscription pay, subscription form there. But I think with that covered, Dr. Batiski, feel free to take it away. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, I want to first off thank my hosts and thank you, Michael, for facilitating this, this invitation and, and my being here tonight. Um, it's always a lot of fun to, to talk to students who are interested in healthcare. You know, it's a, a challenging time for healthcare. As you know, it's been a challenging time for the world over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, certainly we're, we're not quite out of the woods yet. So there's a lot going on. I, I will say that just this an hour and a half ago, I got my booster number two as I gear up for a hopefully keep my fingers crossed the study abroad trip to, to Italy um, in May. So I wanted to be sure I was well boosted. I Full disclosure, I've, I've been a, a participant in the Moderna clinical trial. So um, it's been kind of fun being on the other side of the consent form for a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. As, as we do that, I will say to the audience, um, I I come prepared with some, some slides to give us a visual to look at, so you just don't have to look at me the whole time. Um, but yet, uh, this isn't scripted, so if, if there are some questions that come up along the way, I, I don't mind taking questions during the, the conversation. Um, I, I know we're going to sort of certainly set aside about 15 or 20 minutes at the very end for open q and I'm curious, Michael, do you have a sense for how, how big our audience is? I see four besides me on the Zoom call. I'm just yeah, curious. Currently we have around 15, 20 people who are joining us in live. Overnight. Okay, excellent. So let me share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started here. So here's just sort of an opening slide. I, I appreciated getting that little poster from you all. And um, I know this is hearts for health, but let's tonight pretend it's kidneys for health um, as a nephrologist. So just a few lessons from, from a pediatric nephrologist. I, I wanted to start uh, by really kind of talking you through a little bit about my journey. I will say at the front end, I'm, I'm programmed as a faculty member to always have a disclosure side, slide. Um, I have no financial arrangements, arrangements to disclose related to this topic. I am an academic pediatrician and a patron of the liberal arts. So if there are any of you out there in liberal arts colleges and universities across the country, I applaud you and, and encourage you to, to keep this spirit alive. So here's my journey. So I, I'm uh, a native of, of Ohio, uh, grew up in Northeast Ohio, Youngstown to be, be exact. And I will tell you on the front end, I am a first generation college graduate now. I attended Hiram College 
in Hiram, Ohio, where I continue to be very actively involved as a member of the Board of Trustees. And I actually chair the Student Life Committee. So I, I work with students across a lot of different domains. Um, I was one of those people who was more traditional back in the day, uh, who went from um, college directly to medical school. So it was around this time of the year, April of my junior year that I was gearing up for and taking the MCAT. Um, again, I tell on myself a lot, I took the MCAT twice. Um, back in the day, uh, the MCAT was all given on one day and uh, we sat in large lecture halls with number two lead pencils filling in little bubbles. So we weren't on stone tablets back then, but we were doing it manually. And um, so you took it in April if you were getting ready to apply with uh, the idea that you had a second chance in August to still have a score posted to be reviewed in that cycle. Um, I suspect there are probably some people out there in the audience uh, getting ready to be in the uh, upcoming application cycle. And maybe some of you are currently in the current application cycle. Uh, we can get into some Q&A later if you want. So I did not take gap years. I went uh, from college into medical school. As an Ohioan, uh, Ohio has a lot of schools, and I knew that I was going to be taking out loans. I, I went to a state school, what was called the Medical College of Ohio at the time. It has now, uh, since I've left, merged with the University of Toledo. So it's the University of Toledo School of Medicine, uh, still in Toledo. And uh, from there, I, I, I will say, you know, part of my journey was also rooted in the fact that I, early in my life, uh, heeded the call to serve. When, when I think about uh, why medicine, that's the big looming question in everybody's mind. Um, and I think as you think about your answer to that question, it, it takes some real effort to, to, to dig deep and, and, and reflect on it and to be able to articulate that, that motivation. Um, I talked to a lot of students and um, uh, a comment I hear a lot, in fact, we'll get to this, but I, I literally talked to some students this afternoon and this very topic came up. This idea of the cliche, like I want to help others. And my comment to a young lady this afternoon was, God help us if people going into medicine don't want to help other people. And I, coming upon the 35th anniversary of my, my medical school graduation, and I still think about the fact that I try to make a bit of a difference and help people on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a cliche if you only look at the words, if you even write out fancy words in calligraphy and put them on a plaque and hang them on your wall, that's a cliche. But something my mom taught me a long ago was actions speak louder than words. So maybe the initial thought was, I do wanna help other people. I like science, I like to learn, but I have to put some of those words into action. And for me, the initial call to serve came by way of having a grandmother, maternal grandmother with, with diabetes when I was growing up. And I knew I loved my grandmother and I knew I wanted to help her. And, you know, as a kid, there are only so many things you can do. Uh, but at some point I put two and two together. This thing called diabetes is a disease and that disease needs treatment at the still is, you know, it's cornerstone of treatment for diabetes is insulin. And I saw that there was this person that helped my grandmother in a way that maybe family couldn't, and that was her doctor. So I actually in kindergarten told my family I was going to be a doctor. And the rest is kind of history with some, you know, digging a little bit deeper than a kindergarten's view, kindergartner's view of, of what helping was about. So I did some volunteer work in a hospital that morphed into shadowing. And, you know, I date myself, but this was also at a time before HIPAA. I know HIPAA can be a barrier. Uh, it was certainly well before a global pandemic, which has kept people from doing such things. But even without HIPAA as a law, which put in, was put in place for electronic transfer of records, there was a sense of confidentiality and patient privacy that was still sacred back then. So I got to do some shadowing and long story short, ended up really spending a fair amount of time with a couple of physicians who happened to be orthopedic surgeons. So when I went to medical school in Toledo, 
three months out of college, starting medical school, I really thought I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. So I had that mindset and uh, appreciated anatomy and sort of plotted my way through medical school, sort of thinking about that. And even in my third year of all the required clerkships, I went in thinking that that's what I wanted to do. And I did love the OR and I did enjoy what, what went on there. But I think on reflection, I also realized that as the chemistry major in college who liked the problem solving, who enjoyed talking to people, I was really probably more of a medicine person than a surgical person at that very early primordial branch point of differentiation. So lo and behold, my ninth and 10th months of my, my 12 months of third year medical school, I did pediatrics. Why? Because it was a required rotation. And when I did that rotation, I fell in love with pediatrics. In, in many ways, I, I've said over and over again, I found my tribe. I found my people, the place I, I belonged. And it was certainly the patients and families, but it was also the style of practice. It was the role models. It was the people I worked with, you know, the interns and the residents and the, the attending physicians. And there was a spirit of working around kids that was just, for me, just really very, very motivating. So even though I was at the tail end of my third year, very tired because third year is a busy, very, very, very busy year, I, I found myself so energized to, to do something in pediatrics. So as I started fourth year, I applied for programs in, in pediatrics. I think I knew I wanted to stay in academics even before I knew my specialty because as a kid and as still now, I liked to learn. And at some point I realized I also kind of liked to teach. You know, early in my life, it was maybe tutoring chemistry in college or calculus or maybe TAing in a lab. But sooner or later, I realized I, I really did like teaching. And so academics was, was in my future. And so I knew I would probably do a, a special subspecialty fellowship. So from medical school, I went off to do my residency in Columbus, Ohio. At the time, a lot of places changed names. I went to Columbus Children's Hospital. Now the picture you see here is Nationwide Children's Hospital, which is um, a, a very large children's hospital in Columbus, Ohio. I spent three years there. Uh, that was the program linked with The Ohio State University. And I, in pediatrics, rotated through all of the various specialties of pediatrics from the neonatal ICU to the pediatric ICU, um, outpatient clinics, inpatient wards. Yet in August of my internship year, month two, I was assigned the ward that housed the patients who came in with kidney diseases among some other disorders. And again, I found myself attracted to this kind of patient and the kinds of conditions they had. And then I had a really good attending physician who was a role model at the time, became an advisor and a mentor to me during my training and remains a friend to this day. And we now both sit on the International Pediatric Nephrology Association Council Governing Council. I'm a relatively new member. He's a more senior member, but we, we maintain good close connection. So in looking at fellowships, uh, we had a match for residency at the time. So I matched into to PEDS at, at, at the Columbus Hospital. Um, in fellowship at the time, it, it was not a match process. It was, you know, apply, get interviewed, get offered a job. And so I looked around and ultimately decided it was time to break loose from the state of Ohio, the, the state of my birth and the state of most of my training. So I ended up doing my pediatric nephrology fellowship at Le Bonheur Children's Medical Center, uh, which is the University of Tennessee Memphis Health Sciences Center. And I think even that's changed its name a little bit. And this hospital that you see here is the current version of Le Bonheur, which is um, a lot newer than, than when I was there. Um, most people have not heard of Le Bonheur, but we worked with another hospital about a mile away called St. Jude. And most people have heard of St. Jude. St. Jude is a cancer research hospital and we were their nephrologists. So if a, a child with cancer came in and needed dialysis or needed a kidney renal consultation, we provided that service. 
So any questions up to now? I'm just kind of curious if, if anybody has any thoughts. Has anybody been doing the math at how long I trained? <laughs> There's so a question. So far, no questions in the chat. So far, nothing. Okay. Uh, but but they'll be rolling in soon. Thank you, Michael. Well, um, if you're doing the math, you know, it's four years in college, four years in medical school, three years in pediatric residency training, and then another three years in pediatric nephrology training. So just, you know, I think many people have heard of residencies, but I want to spend a little more time on, on fellowship. Um, my fellowship was three years. Uh, over that 36 months, 12 months are clinical, 24 months are research or scholarly work. And I just put this out there, year one, it was clinical, clinical research. So two and one, two and one. And I was on call every other weekend. And um, during residency, I took call in the hospital and was on call as often as every third night. And we did the 36 hour shifts. It was before there were duty hours and things like that. As a fellow, the big step up was to be able to take call from home. Um, the second and third years were two clinical months somewhere over that course of that year and 10 research months. And then I was only on call every fourth weekend. So you can see that first year was a pretty intense year. And during that time, you really, really learn a lot of your specialty, your subspecialty, get indoctrinated into it away, in a way. But you also find something that you're going to spend the rest of your time in a scholarly pursuit, because as a fellow, it's not just about putting in the time and getting the experience, but also coming away with ideally a publication or two, and certainly some experience that set you up for an academic position. Um, Michael brings up the question, did I deal with any burnout as you were continually in school? Um, you know, it's a great question, Michael. I certainly have had my ebbs and flows and, you know, life hasn't always been generally perfect, but I, I think there, there was a piece of the reality at the time that you would put in a lot of time and be very, very busy, but life would get better eventually. So I, I, I don't know that I would have called it burnout at the time. Probably the most tired I ever felt was at the end of my internship year, uh, where, you know, I mean, there were weeks where there were easily, if you do the math over every third night, there were 100, 120 hour weeks. You know, you go in at seven in the morning one day, say on Monday, spend the night and go home Tuesday at five and get a night's sleep and go back the next day. And it, um, we weren't guaranteed days off. Um, and yet, I think there was also a little bit of that. I had colleagues in surgery that were on every other night. <laughs> and, and the, you know, the concept of a resident comes from the idea that there were times when you as a trainee would reside in the hospital and or on the property of the hospital. So I guess I always kind of, I'm a glass half. Now, you know, there are glass half full, glass half empty. I'm like, just refill the glass. You know, I, I'm the eternal optimist, almost to a fault, I will say. Um, but so I, I, I won't admit to it, but, but certainly there were moments when I would coin my phrase, some days are endless, yet the months fly by. I can't tell you how many a night I stood staring out of a window in a hospital thinking, when will this night ever end? Um, but I, I also think that it was probably at a point in history where people didn't talk about that. You know, I have to realize that, you know, life has changed so much. And I see that because I see the trainees in action as we speak. So great question. We can talk more about that later. I've always found, and this will come become maybe a little clearer as we move forward. One of my vaccines against burnout is, has been having some variety in, in my career and not doing the same thing over and over again. So I've kind of been able to reinvent myself in a few ways. So let's see, where are we here? So I did some research uh, during my fellowship and was gearing myself up to you know, be a junior faculty member on a research track. I did a, a review of a condition called nephrotic syndrome. I wrote a case report. I spent a couple, a couple um, some time in a couple of different basic science labs. I, I had another, I probably had 
two to three publications during my fellowship. And yet when I, um, you know, life happens and um, during my tail end of my second year, early part of my third year of fellowship, my mom became relatively pretty ill rather suddenly and um, was in the hospital for a long time in Northeast Ohio and I'm in Memphis, Tennessee. And, um, and she died rather suddenly during my tail end of my third year of fellowship. And that really kind of stopped me in my tracks and made me re reassess where am I going with all of this? I was on this research track because I thought that was what ex was expected of me. And it really sort of forced me to do some internal thinking about where is this going? And ultimately I came to the conclusion that being in the lab was not what I was passionate about. I still wanted to be a nephrologist. I still wanted to be on faculty. So I decided to shift gears and I stayed on in Memphis as a faculty member for about three years after I finished my fellowship to refashion myself as a clinician educator. Uh, see another comment in the chat. Um, if I could do anything differently, what would it be? You know, that's an easy question. I, I hear, here's advice. Always listen to your mom. Two things I should have listened to my mom about. I should have taken Spanish when I was in high school and carried it on from there. And I sure should have learned to officially type because I cannot type and talk at the same time. And I spent a lot of time at a keyboard. Um, I, another great reference and maybe a little bit of liberal, liberal arts influence here. So I took Latin for four years in high school. And if you didn't know this, you'll come away with this little tidbit. The root of the word doctor is doceo, the Latin verb to teach, D-O-C-E-O. -E so I, in some forums, say I'm a teacher that happens to practice medicine because I, I do a lot of teaching. Uh, so I would have learned Spanish and I would have learned to type. Um, the rest, you know, I, I am never one to live in regret. I look back and honor the past, yet I'm always a bit of a forward thinker by nature. So, but great question. I'm big on reflecting and encourage a lot of people to do that as well. You know, another disclosure, I've only been in academic medicine, which is a bit of a sheltered world, I, I might add. Um, but I think for me, it's been a great fit. And, you know, I've, it's afforded me a lot of opportunities to continue to see patients while getting to sort of fuel my interests in, in other things. So, I've had four faculty positions. Um, I mentioned I stayed on faculty three years in Memphis. I went back to my medical school for three years and I'll show you what I did when I went back there. I went back to where I did my residency for another 10 years. And then I came here to Emory. This month will be 13 years on, on the 20th. So if I go back to my first early part of, of my, my faculty career, I did half-time general peds and half-time nephrology. And in general pediatrics, I worked with residents and medical students in outpatient clinics and directed the continuity clinics. And I was the equivalent of what would be today called a hospitalist. I took care of hospitalized patients with the residents. And in that setting, got to refine some clinical skills that allowed me to brush up on taking care of kids with asthma and seizure disorders and things that weren't just nephrology. I certainly got to teach in a lot of different settings from you know, first and second year medical students in clinical skills, third and fourth year students in the clinical arena, residents, et cetera. I got my feet wet on what it was like to be a faculty member. And that often means uh, being involved with committees. From there, I got recruited back to my medical school as the residency program director. So it was a small pre pediatric residency program director. I think we took six or seven residents per year. And as an alumnus of this school, I was asked to serve on the admissions committee. And as a member of the admissions committee, I ultimately, um, in a fairly short order of time, through some interesting circumstances, found myself as the associate dean for admissions. So I was in the admissions office overseeing the admission process, um, very involved in deliberations over, over files and interviews. And uh, that was really what um, has set the tone for, for a lot of the things I, I even do now. Once again, um, went back to a place where I was the second, only the second pediatric nephrologist. It was a pretty small center, but I had 
not only differing experiences at a higher administrative level, you know, I became a member of the dean staff, was um, involved in weekly dean level meetings, uh, hearing about the goings on that often only get sort of rolled out in, you know, announcements to the faculty where I was literally in sort of the, the war room as, as things were happening. And I really enjoyed that. In fact, the dean of the medical school at that time, uh, this is where the continuity comes in. She, when I was a medical student there, was a renal, is a renal pathologist, was a renal pathologist that taught me kidney pathology and wrote my dean's letter as I graduated from medical school. She was an assistant dean at the time and rose to the level of the dean. So it was really awesome to work with her. I got recruited back to Ohio State as a pediatric nephrologist. And there I became the director of the dialysis unit. Um, I ended up uh, starting to uh, do some work in clinical trials. Um, so uh, while I'm not a primary researcher, I was, uh, able to take advantage of an opportunity as medications used for kids were needing to be studied in kids. And so this is the late nineties. Now I ended up being involved in several clinical trials and ultimately became an associate medical director of the clinical trial unit. I found myself involved in, um, a lot of, um, cooperative, uh, large multi-center studies, many of them placebo-controlled clinical trials. And that's where I said, and it's funny to be on the other side of the uh, consent form as the, the subject in the Moderna trial. Um, but then I also um, found myself at some point as a vocal advocate for kids in clinical trials. I, at some point, was on a tripartite uh, commission, if you will, task force that included representatives from the FDA, the NIH, and then those of us in the clinical trial uh, field, if you will. And so, you know, made some visits to Washington to discuss how to better design clinical trials. And lo and behold, I was on the admissions committee. And after being on the admissions committee for a little bit, I also um, started to work with and oversee the BSMD program that was at Ohio State at the time that has since disbanded. But then once again, I found myself um, as the Associate Dean for Admissions. And again, um, further refining different skills, shifting from a basic science view of research to clinical research that I was learning on the job, and uh, still maintaining uh, some work with medical students, some work with, with pre-medical students, and, and even undergrads. And even uh, there, there were a couple of times that um, I got to go on a couple of study abroad trips with undergrads from Ohio State to, to London. Um, the question about if I did anything, to, I would have loved to have traveled more. I still love to travel. I, I got to do a three week study abroad to London as a college student. And then I went back a few years later as a faculty member with undergrads. And it, it was really kind of interesting comparing and contrast contrasting what London was like in 1981 when I was there, no cell phones, no ATM cards versus, you know, what it was like in something like 2007. Um, and yet Big Ben kind of looked the same. The, the halls of parliament looked very similar. So, so that was a lot of fun. So I had a lot of fun at Ohio State um, and yet got recruited to Emory as the director of pediatric hypertension with my, my work in, in hypertension. Um, not long after I got here, I was approached by uh, an investigator at University of Rochester who asked me to come on board with him as he submitted some grants to the NIH. And we had about six years of funding, NIH funding, to study neurocognition in kids with hypertension compared against normal well well children who didn't have hypertension. And it was one of the early studies to look at target organ as it related to the brain as a target organ of high blood pressure. I also teamed up at some point with a pastoral theologian to do a qualitative study of hope in children with chronic illness. And we piloted that at a small level, used that pilot data to get some grant funding from the Lilly Foundation and expanded that project. I serve as a member of the admissions committee. 
I was on the residency selection committee. I started doing some pro bono work for the pre-health advising office, Emory, with my past experience in, in, um, in admissions. And then in 2013, I became a member of what we call our society system here at Emory. When our students enter, they're it's almost like, you know, Hogwarts. You're in one of four societies. I happen to be in the Osler Society. Um, there are four small groups in each society. So we have a class of about 140. Every even year, I get a new crop of about nine first year students and I work with them until they graduate. So I've got a class graduating this year, 2022. And um, I've got a class of 2024 who just became third years. So 24s will, or 22s will leave. And then I'll get a new crop that will come in this summer, the class of 2026. And that's arguably one of the most fun things I get to do because I'm with them in the classroom. I'm with them in the clinical skills center as we're teaching physical exam skills and history taking. And then I'm helping them select residency programs and writing letters for them. It really is very rewarding. In the pre-health office, uh, so I became a society advisor in 2013. In 2014, I was asked to take a half-time position in the college overseeing pre-health advising. And in that role, I have a I'm the executive director, we have a full-time director, we have four assistant directors and a program coordinator, and we have honed a group of about 20 peer mentors who are undergraduates, who are our eyes and ears around campus. And, and that's really a lot of fun. In uh, November, 2020, I was asked to serve as the pediatric clerkship director. So I oversee clinical medical education for third and fourth year medical students. So. What I'm really kind of getting at is I get to do a lot of things. I say I tend to juggle. Um, and at the same time, through all of this, I keep a thread of, of patient care um, in, in, in my life. And I see some, some chats coming in. Um, two questions from Maddie. Uh, with medicine, there's always the difficulty with seeing people in pain and death. But comparatively, when working with children, how do you mentally handle that? I'm incredibly interested in pediatrics and I'm wondering what is the mental toll that it takes on you? Well, those are great questions. And I will say that um, I, I suspect it's, it's probably a combination of being built for that work while also being trained for that work. Um, while it can be incredibly sad to see a child die or a child suffer. Um, there's also some salvation in knowing you're gonna help that child. Um, I will say, just when you look at the big grand scheme of things, there are more adults than there are children. There are more sick adults than there are sick children. That doesn't make it any easier. And certainly when you practice in large children's hospitals, you sometimes see the most significant cases of all. Yet there's an, a resilience to kids that is amazing. Um, just a, a, a spirit of, of wonder and joy. It doesn't mean that every child is blissfully happy even while really ill, but I think having the tendency to want to be there to help, relieve some of that suffering and some of that pain, live with some of the joy that comes with it, um, is part of the story, but then you're trained. You know, you spend time working along the way with other people who, who help you through that. And there's no doubt that having reliable, trustworthy colleagues is, is a big part of the story. Um, I can tell you that as recently as a week ago, um, I had the opportunity, um, I'm still in touch with some really good friends from, from my residency program. And what's interesting, uh, there are seven or eight of us on a little text group. And the week before that, somebody sent out a text. Now, many of them still live in Columbus. They're general pediatricians in the community. And um, somebody put out a little message, hey, let's meet next Friday for lunch at 1230. And of course the thought enters my mind, wouldn't that be fun? And I was able to do some things. I didn't want to commit to it on the text group, but 
Last Thursday night, I was in the air right around this time to fly to Columbus, spend the night, got up the next morning, saw some friends at Children's Hospital and met my pals for lunch at 1230 and was on a flight back to Atlanta at 330. And it was so good for my soul to see five of my colleagues that I spent three of the hardest years of my life with. And, uh, and that was amazing. Uh, you know, I, even in 1987, as an intern, in a class of 18, I was in the minority as only one of five guys. So my other friends at lunch were six women who were general pediatricians doing private practice in, in Columbus, Ohio. And I showed up and surprised the heck out of them. But it, it was just really great to be with, with such good friends. And so make friends, keep friends. I think my longest lasting friend so far, she and I went to kindergarten together through high school together, and we still keep in touch. So don't forget where you come from. Don't forget your people. And I mean, friends and family and, and colleagues become, you know, family. I mean, and again, I, I date myself a little bit, but we spent a lot of time in the hospital and we had each other's backs. We knew who needed to get to dinner, who was having a rough night, who needed some extra help. And that's a little bit that gets lost, I have to say, seeing things in action today. Um, I think things are different. I, 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 I'm not one for saying, oh, back in the day, we had it so much worse. Things are just different. But what has really been a support to me was being open to having other people in my life that are very important to me, including my family, including my friends, et cetera. So thanks for the question. So my day-to-day -day routine, um, it's pretty much not routine. Um, I, I have certain things in my, if I look at the big picture of a, a year that, that, that come into play, I do about four weeks of inpatient coverage at our big hospital. I have a weekly clinic. In fact, this morning, uh, Thursday morning is my, my clinic day. And so this morning I had 11 kids on my, my, my schedule. Not everybody showed up, but, but I had a pretty busy clinic. Um, as I am in that role as the overseer of pre-health advising here at Emory for our undergrads applying to medical school, we do what we call a composite letter. And we probably put together about 300 letters a year. I sign them all. And my commitment to the process is I make time to meet with each of those people. So I do about 360 one-on-one -on -one 30 minute interviews from about January through April, May. And uh, so that was how I spent part of my afternoon. And then I was part of us, you know, at um, a search interview at, at four o'clock to end my day. Um, but I started my morning with a bike ride before I went to clinic and then I was able to get home and, um, get a few more miles in because it was like 75 degrees in Atlanta today. And the sun was just a little too hard to, 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 to avoid. And, um, anyway, um, my, my days are a little bit different from, 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 from most, um, my weeks on service in the hospital, I pretty much get very little else done because, the, the hospital is, is a busy place. Uh, we take care of kids on dialysis in the various intensive care units. Uh, we medically manage patients who are getting transplants. And I work at a pretty large pediatric kidney transplant center where we do high 20s, low 30s pediatric kidney transplants. Um, and it, it just varies. Um, Sometimes of the year, you know, I interview for the admissions committee. I interview for our residency selection committee. Uh, we have a fellowship program that we interview for as well. Um, now with the third year group of medical students, we meet twice a month early evening. So Tuesday evening, I had a session from 4.30 to six with my third year group, their new third years. And then my class of 2022 getting ready to graduate, um, they, they are post-match, they're in their last month of medical school, and we're doing our graduation get-together dinner next Wednesday. So you can see it, it varies. Next Thursday, I will be um, headed to Denver for a pediatric academic meeting. I'm giving a talk on Saturday on social determinants of health, climate change, and its impact on kids with hypertension. Um, next month, I'm hoping to be in, in Italy for 10 days on a study abroad trip with a classics professor from one of our colleges. 
And then in May, I go back to, to Denver or June, I go back to Denver for um, a pre-health advising meeting. So let's see. Um, so Katie asks, what is my favorite part of working in my field? Um, you know, I could almost say whatever I'm doing at the time. Um, there is nothing like seeing your patients, patients that you know and 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 care about. I, I tell them myself, you know, this morning um, I had a new patient scheduled at eight o'clock and they arrived at about 8.30. The mother was all flustered. They had gone to the wrong building and she was so apologetic. And, and her son that I was to see um, for elevated blood pressure, that's my thing. Um, has autism and I could just tell she, she, she just had a rough day and I just let her talk for a bit. And, you know, I just went about getting the questions I needed answered and tried to frame what was going on. And as I was examining the this a teenager, 14 year old, uh, I, I do manual blood pressures. I'm old school like that. And when I, you know, stepped away from, from doing the blood pressure, his, his mother just looked at me, she said, you were just so calm. I'm like, that's the best compliment I think I've had all week. I'm like, thank you for saying that. I, you know, this is just who I am. She goes, you know, I came in here and I was all upset and I was all, she goes, but you've just brought the level of energy down so much. Thank you. And I was just like, what a great start to my day. You know, even though you were late, what a great rally. So, so I, I love seeing patients and, you know, I've gotten asked, what would you do if you couldn't be a doctor? Um, Maybe I just wouldn't be, but I mean, I love teaching. And, and at the end of the day, I, I love, and I think it's all, see, I see the intersectionality here. As a pediatrician, I follow growth and development. As a subspecialist, growth and development is important, especially if one of your major organ systems is involved, like a, the kidneys. But I also see the pre-medical students that I work with growing from entering college students to getting ready to apply. I see my medical students coming in, fresh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, first-year medical students who then walk out a few years later as doctors. And in my role as a small group advisor, I meet them at orientation and I put their hood on at graduation. I mean, I, I get teary, you know, it really means that much. And my first class was the class of 2016. And, and there are students I still keep in touch with from 16 and 18 and 20. My class of 2020 is, is on a group me text and everybody, you know, sort of celebrates everybody's birthdays this morning. Uh, just as I was heading up to clinic, I knew it was one of my, I have them programmed into my phone, one of my fourth year's birthday. So I wished him a happy birthday on my way to clinic. They become part of the family. And it's just, even if I'm not teaching them nephrology or pediatrics, I, I do what I can to teach them what it's like to be a doctor. And I say this over and over again, but my, my guide points are compassion and empathy. I never wanna forget what it was like to be a medical student. Uh, it's not always the most comfortable place to be, um, but, but that in many ways is my mantra and the, 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 the mission I try to live out. Um, we'll talk a little bit. Ashley has a question about the most common kidney problem that I see in children. Actually, one of my cases, I think we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that to an extent. So, so I, I think I will get to answer that here in, in a few minutes. So let's see. How are we doing with time, Michael? I'm, I, I can babble. It's 846 already. I'm sorry. So let's talk about some cases. So, so getting to that, that last question, what if I saw a newborn baby with this condition called obstructive uropathy? Well, what does that mean? Um, you look at the words, uropathy, something going on with the urinary tract, obstructive, something's blocking or obstructing. Um, sometimes this is picked up prenatally as moms get pre prenatal ultrasounds. Sometimes the babies present at birth with, with one problem or another. Usually these babies will spend time in the neonatal ICU. So I've often met these patients on arrival in the NICU. Sometimes it's a prenatal diagnosis and we know the patient's coming. And there's certainly often a need for ongoing outpatient follow-up watching for signs of kidney failure. So if you are developing as a fetus in your mom with your kidneys blocked to some degree, the kidneys are not always well-formed. So that can lead to 
functional problems with your kidneys that could be very severe enough to even warrant dialysis in the neonatal ICU, or maybe over time you outgrow your kidney function. So many of these kids will eventually need a transplant and sometimes dialysis on their way to transplant. And we, when we look at, I told you we're a big, busy pediatric kidney transplant center. If you look at what leads kids to need dialysis or transplant, what we call K-cut, C-A-K-U-T, congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract are one of the big leading causes. So um, this is an x-ray. Um, if you've never seen an x-ray before, this would be looking at the baby from the side. These are some air bubbles in the guts. This, I think you can see my arrow. Michael, can you see my arrow as I'm pointing? Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. This would be the pelvis, this is the femur. So what this big black blob is, is the bladder. So the bladder, this is a contrast study. So a catheter gets placed into the bladder. Some liquid that shows up on x-ray gets, gets put in there, a dye, if you will. And, and this big round thing is the bladder, a lot bigger than it ought to be. And if you look here, you sort of see some irregularity. That's because that bladder has been pushing in utero against a fixed obstruction that here you see, this is where the urine, where the urine would come from the bladder into the posterior urethra. And then here you see that contrast kind of stops. It's because there's a blockage there. That's a, something that it's a birth defect but can certainly lead to the kidneys upstream from the bladder sort of developing under high pressure, which is an abnormal situation. So this is a little cartoon of what this would look like. This is if we're looking at the frontal view, this is what happens normally. We've got kidneys, red blood is good blood coming from the aorta supplying the kidneys, blue blood, the venous blood coming back, blood goes in the kidneys, filters through, urine gets made, travels down these things called the ureters, trickle into the bladder and then to the outside world. So these posterior urethral valves are valves or this like tissue membrane from the posterior, the backside of the urethra, and they lead to blockage. And so that's one of the more common reasons a baby or child could have kidney failure. And again, life is often a spectrum. It's neither black or white, yes or no, it's a matter of degree. But these are many kids that we would follow from the NICU throughout their life, maybe throughout their life, just with a little bit of impaired kidney function, maybe enough that they require dialysis or even a kidney transplant. So I, you've heard me talk a lot about high blood pressure. High blood pressure can happen really at any point in, in one's age. Um, I, I date myself, but the first big report on, on blood pressure in kids was published in 1977. Ancient history to most of you, I was in high school. Um, we, we've since learned a lot about blood pressure in kids. And I like to believe that I'm part of the people that have helped us learn some of that. Um, this might be the kind of kid I see. Anything notable about this patient? Now, this is me in real life, maybe a little chunkier than I need to be. Um, we're looking at an app that helps track blood pressure that I helped develop with this woman here. Um, here you see a young man who probably has a genetic tendency toward high blood pressure, and he probably has a, a little bit of a BMI that's a little higher than it ought to be. Um, what we certainly see in the time that I've been practicing pediatrics is uh, epidemic, if you will, of, of childhood obesity, which has led to some diseases typically seen in adults, lipid problems like hyperlipidemia, hypercholesterolemia, um, blood pressure problems, and even type two diabetes happening in younger kids. So um, many times, um, a lot of my practice has been focused on, on this, this population, and I'm often working along with a nutritionist. In fact, today in my clinic, I had a couple of kids with elevated blood pressure, and I have a nutritionist with me. So a team sport, medicine is a team sport, another um, point, point to learn. This woman over here is actually a, a nursing faculty member at Emory, and she and I have teamed up on a, a number of projects related to recognizing blood pressure in kids, and uh, she and I talked about this app and she was able to make that app actually happen. It's called Pedia Blood Pressure, BP. So, And then, you know, another common thing we might see is a, a nine-year-old with blood in the urine. If you think about it, if, 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 if there is a urine cup with, with blood in it, uh, anybody want to take a guess, left, middle, or right, which, which, which urine cup has, has blood in it? Live stream is a bit delayed, so we probably won't get answers in 
Okay, okay. Well, it could be any of them, believe it or not. So one could have gross hematuria, not gross, like ugh, gross, but gross is visible to the naked eye. Or you might have microscopic hematuria. So you might have urine that looks very yellow, but when you check it out and look under the microscope, you actually see blood cells in there. So depending on the color of the urine and, and how much there is, that might help us localize where along the urinary tract the blood's coming from. Generally speaking, brighter, redder blood seems a little fresher. It's probably a little further down in that urinary tract that we saw. Um, blood that comes from the kidneys and has longer time to percolate through is usually more brown or I live in Atlanta, Coca-Cola colored. Um, and then this is pointing at what we call a cast. If those blood cells get into the microscopic tubules of the kidney, they sometimes form these little bricks that we call casts. When we see that, that's a sign that that blood has to have come from the kidney. So I see another question. How does the catheter get inserted if there's a blockage? Great question. A very small catheter that is often a tiny little feeding tube to, to be able, and again, it's usually not complete blockage. That's that whole shades of gray thing. It's enough blockage to cause everything upstream to be abnormal, but, but sometimes you can get a little tiny catheter through a little, I mean, these are little babies, often premature babies with tiny, tiny catheters. So good question though. Is there blockage between the bladder and the kidneys or the urinary tract to the bladder? Well, the bladder is part of the urinary tract. If it's the posterior urethra, it's the far part or distal part of the bladder as it goes into the urethra, which is the tube that leads out to the outside world. But there can be obstructions elsewhere too. But the more common one that we see on a regular basis is this posterior urethral valves. You guys have great questions. So a child like this might have something like this condition called post-strep glomerulonephritis, proliferative glomerulonephritis. So this is a picture of a kidney biopsy. If we look up here in the top left corner, this is what your kidney looks like under the microscope. I say the kidney is still the most beautiful organ histopathologically. Um, this is where the, in, in 3D, this would be a bit of a globe, but if you take a slice through it, it looks like this round thing. These are little tiny blood vessels, and this is where the inside world meets the outside world. The blood percolates through here, filters impurities across. This here is where the early part of the urine gets made. It snakes its way into these microscopic little tubules that become part of the urinary tract. So this is what a normal looking, what we call glomerulus looks like. And this is a post-strep proliferative nephritis affected glomerulus. It's just, you see much more purple there, many more spots, proliferative meaning proliferating and growing, lots of inflammation going on. And then these, these two top slides would be a light microscope. If we look over here at the left, this would be electron microscopy, which magnifies things thousands of times. And we see this is pointing at what we call a deposit of immune complexes, so immunoglobulin and something called C3. Now this black light looking thing, this is immunofluorescence, which is another technique that pathologists use. So I'm bringing this up to make, home, make a few points. I might take care of a child like this who has this condition. I might actually do the kidney biopsy, a needle biopsy myself. And I also rely on my pathologist friends to help interpret what we're seeing here and help me make a diagnosis. Once again, medicine, a team sport. So where do I work now? I work in Atlanta, Georgia. Here's a shot of our skyline. Here's a picture down here that I took. If anybody's watched The Walking Dead, this is called the Jackson Street Bridge, which is often on my bike trips back and forth through downtown and looking into that, that Memphis, or Atlanta skyline. Um, this is a rendering of um, what our new campus will look like. So I had clinic this morning in this building over here in the bottom left. This we call the Center for Advanced Pediatrics. I don't know what's all that advanced about it, but that's where we work and I park in this parking garage. This big hospital in the middle is literally being built as we speak. It's going to be 19 stories when it's complete, almost 700 beds with room to grow as Atlanta continues to grow um, with some support buildings around it. But I think we're about up to here right now and they're literally, uh, every week I go, it just seems a little bit taller. We're scheduled to move in there in a little less than two and a half years, September 2024, like the last Sunday in September 2024. Um, 
And this is a picture of the Emory campus with the Emory part of the Emory skyline or the Atlanta skyline off in the distance to the west. This is one of my small groups. In fact, this is the group that's graduating. Um, a couple of people weren't here in this photo. And this is what our School of Medicine looks like, which I realize is in my, my, my background right now. So um, we can stop there and see if there are any other questions. I hope we have some time. I didn't think I'd even talk that long, but we did take questions along the way. Yeah, so. I mean, time flew, honestly. This was a fantastic presentation. I really loved every second of it. And um, I honestly didn't even notice that it time, time, time passed that quick. I mean, you know, 40 minutes went away in a second. So if you're, if it's all right with you, would you mind taking, you know, not at all, not at all. Would another half an hour work or how long would you like? However, to if, however you want, okay. I'm here, you're there. So, yeah. So we have a, quite a few questions that, you know, we'd love to go through. Mm -hmm. um, if we could also get a little more into the application side of things, that'd be great later on. But uh, I just, first of all, want to thank you. I mean, that was an amazing presentation, very engaging. Um, we had a lot of questions pour in uh, and a lot of interest. I can already tell a lot of enthusiasm from students. So to get through the questions we have, we wanted to cover a few more, specifically with the advances in technology mm -hmm. in, in nephrology so far. How has this affected the field since you started your career? Great question. Um, you know, I, I would say that Honestly, um, the most truly palpable effect has been, or impact has been um, just com the computer. You know, I'll leave it that broadly. Um, I, I can say that um, I, I started using email, I think during my fellowship. Um, we, at that point, didn't have an electronic record. Uh, I, you know, I, I joke that, you know, we weren't doing our progress notes on stone tablets and chisels but we literally wrote notes and prescriptions, for instance. Um, and, you know, we're at that point now where it's just a foregone conclusion that I'm gonna do my notes on the computer. I'm going to send refills electronically and just the ability to, to communicate back and forth is, is amazing. Um, another patient I saw this morning, um, a 19 year old who has autism. I follow for high blood pressure. He's growing out of his pediatric subspecialist specialist, going to a pediatrician in his small hometown, um, having some other problems and the family's caught in this crossfire of, Oh, but he's a special needs kid. I'm like, but he's 19. He's an adult. Um, and so I was able to, call his pediatrician, get a sense for what she, there were some testing she wanted ordered. And I sent an email to one of my interventional radiology, radiology colleagues through the record where they could review the, the file and was able to get back to the pedi pediatrician today as you know, a place to go. Um, when I can, I mentioned, I don't type and talk at the same time. So my style in clinic is, I got clinic Thursday morning, so Wednesday, I go in, I pre-review my ch charts. I know who's coming. I kind of can do a little bit of at least uh, reminding in a bit of a draft note as to you know, what's going on with the patient. So when I go in to the room, I almost never touch the computer. Yet, um, I use it as a tool. So I don't sit there and type and talk at the same time, taking my note or worse yet, keeping my back or shoulder to them. But I can pull up that cystogram that I showed you and show them what the bladder looks like. I can pull up the image of a kidney ultrasound and say, this is what we're seeing when I say we're doing a kidney ultrasound. I can pull up the growth chart and show them the plots along the way or the trend in labs. And that's pretty amazing when you think about it. Um, I can also send patients messages back and forth. Um, so the computer has had an amazing amount of impact on, on my life, let alone, um, better imaging. Um, I'm the oldest of five. I don't think my mom ever had a prenatal ultrasound. Now I see many kids with things detected early, early in life. You know, another big area, if I, you're studying genetics in some form or fashion, I'm sure genetic testing um, is amazing. Um, I think in my fellowship, you always, you, you knew there were some research labs around the country that might do a specific gene test for one condition. 
and you'd maybe send a sample and maybe eight months later when they had enough samples to run, you'd get some report back. There is a gene panel that I, I just literally printed the results out today on a patient with a buckle smear, you know, like a little Q-tip, you know, around the, 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 the mouth or a blood draw. I can, and, and let me tell you, beyond the research labs, when genetic testing became a little bit more available, it was like $2,000 and insurance wouldn't cover it because it's not standard of care. Nowadays, I can order a panel that's commercially available, screening for 385 genes that could affect kidneys. And the company will take almost every form of insurance, including Medicaid, and they guarantee that the family pays no more than two or $300 out of pocket. Now that's still a lot of money, but for the information you get and you might forego a kidney biopsy or something like that, it's just amazing. So I marvel at what will you all see in your career span because I've seen this in about 35 years and we're still going, let alone you know watch a night of TV and how many monoclonal antibody commercials do you see? So the medicines we use, um, the, I mean, just, in real time as a as we've navigated this pandemic. Warp speed to develop, a, not only finding out this virus and calling it what it is, but having a vaccine that's safe and effective. And it's it's amazing. So I'll, I'll stop there. I could go on and on, but. I mean, there's a lot to mention. So I yeah. can't on that one. You mentioned this before about specifically pathology, but we were curious to ask, what does your collaboration across specialties look like? For example, you know, you're within nephrology, mm -hmm. you work with pathology. What about urology or sure. specialties? We, we share, there, there are a lot of patients we share, um, we share together with. Um, so I would say that um, uh, certainly urology, you know, they're the surgical side of the urinary tract where the medical side and many of those newborn babies we're, we're both seeing, they, they help with the mechanical side of surgery. We're following for the, the medical side of the kidney injury and what may result from that. Um, certainly I rely on radiologists to interpret films, pathologists who run the lab and everything from biopsies, but also blood counts and chemistry values and things like that. We, um, you don't think of it as a disease you see very often in kids, but we're at a big center and in a place where we see a lot of a condition called lupus, which is an autoimmune disease and lupus can affect the kidneys. So we share a lot of patients with our rheumatology colleagues. Um, who else? Um, like if I'm on service in the hospital, we're, we're always consulted in the pediatric ICU. So the question was raised about what's the common, common kidney diseases. That post-strep nephritis I talked about is the most common acute acquired kidney disease in kids. Um, Yet, when you practice in a big, busy children's hospital like ours, where there's a large service of patients getting cared for first with cancer, chemotherapy can affect the kidneys. If you're, you know, we support a pediatric ICU where kids could, you know, have septic shock to, you know, severe liver disease or, you know, be in liver failure, waiting for their liver transplant, they go into kidney failure. Um, and then we have a cardiac ICU where we almost always have babies and older kids on forms of dialysis as they recover from their heart surgery or because of heart failure, the kidneys don't get enough blood and the kidneys fail. We have a neonatal ICU, you know, newborns that, that come in with these birth defects or develop problems as a result. So, so we often support those kinds of, 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 of services as well. Hypertension falls within our bailiwick of, of, typical consults, and then things like fluid and electrolyte balance issues and things like that. So like when I'm a service, we start rounding in the ICUs to do, see our consult patients first. And then we usually go to the floor where we have our nephrology patients. Um, the way our center works, and it isn't like this everywhere, the only time a kidney transplant patient is truly under the care of the surgeon alone is in the OR. So if somebody gets called in because there's a kidney available for them or maybe a parent or you know, a, 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 an adult is giving them a kidney. They come in to our team and we work them up and get them ready. They go off to the OR. When they come out of the OR, 
me, my fellow, we're often meeting the surgeon in the ice in the post anesthesia care unit, the recovery room to talk about how the case went. And then the, the kids often spend two or three nights in the ICU just because there's a lot of nursing care involved. So there's a lot of collaborative. Um, we get consulted from all the different surgery, surgical services. If there's a blood pressure problem or a fluid and electrolyte problem, neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, um, urology, general pediatric, and general pediatric surgery. So there, there's a lot of teamwork. And then it goes beyond the doctors. You know, we, we, we certainly work with many advanced practice nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs. We work with um, various therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, nutritionists are important. Um, um, you know, it, it, it's just a wide variety of people. And it's the beauty of a children's life. child life specialists are involved. The teachers are often at the table making rounds when we're talking about our patients. So it, and therapy dogs, you know, we, that's the fun part about children's. Well, shifting to the application side of things, mm -hmm. many people are entering the application cycles, like you mentioned, and they're preparing for the ones next year. Um, it's, it's really just a time to, to wait for and, and to um, prepare for. Mm -hmm. But with that said, each medical school seems to have their own kind of cliche or not cliche, but th their own aspects they look for mm -hmm. in a candidate. So for example, there are medical schools who prioritize research or they right. prioritize community service. Right. Um, it could be a, a wide variety of things. And it's just the variance that comes along with having, having different admissions committees mm -hmm. or different priorities in general. Right. How, can, how can students, first of all, gain an understanding of what that is for a medical school and mm -hmm. based on that, how can they accordingly, you know, decide, okay, this is the best choice for me because there's a lot of things to consider and I'm sure that's right. High on the list. Well, that's, that's a great question and a conversation I have a lot with, with many Emory students, especially those in our composite letter process. So you kind of, I, I think about it in a couple of ways. Um, on one hand, um, you know, all medical schools exist to train future physicians. That's a given. Um, there, there is certainly, um, that's a core part of the mission that is hard to ignore. Yet, as you pointed out, Michael, how they do it and you know, who they're trying to do it to is, is what is the nuance. I don't think there is one person anywhere that would be, the perfect fit at every medical school. So, so looking at fit is important. Um, another one of my little, I need to write an essay about this, but many people who are in this position as I was, the last time you applied to an academic program at school was applying to college. And if you think about your high school friends, your classmates, um, every one of them, could go to college if they wanted. I, what I say is not everybody could come to Emory or Duke or Vanderbilt or Stanford or Harvard. Um, some people go to a community college. Some people go to a state university. Some people go part-time, you know. And then some people don't need to go to college and we need skilled trades people too. So, but even if somebody who wants to be a plumber or an electrician wants to go to college, they could go to college. It's very different for medical school. There are not enough spots for the people that want them. And in many ways, the schools get to select and shape the classes that they're looking for. And you point out a good point. That may change over time. And this is me having a lot more birthdays than any of you, I'm sure. Honestly, I was doing another talk for another group just last week. And something I found a few months ago, I pulled out and took a snapshot of on my phone, um, my med school composite photo from graduation from 1987. I look at that picture and the faces in that picture. And I fast forward to my reality of, I look out into the audience of a first year class at Emory or a graduating class at Emory for that matter. And there's so much difference. I mean, I'm, sort of paraphrasing my, my data, but about a third of my class was women. No more than five out of 150 were people of color. Um, 
and I look now and there's so much more variety and so much more diversity. I was in the traditional pool that went from college to medical school. Like, you know, I graduated from college in June. We were on quarters. I started medical school in August. And I look now at a class that I work with and 70 plus percent of them has spent at least a year or more outside of college. One of my graduating students this year finished college, spent three years at the NIH in one of their post back research programs, came here as an MD PhD student, and now eight years later, he's graduating. This is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. So, so there's no safety school when it comes to med school, right? They're all a reach. The question is how far of a reach? And that's what you need to determine. There are some other decisions you need to think about. And these are, you know, rhetorical to some extent, but also the things you need to reflect on. As I look at a selection of schools, I need to think theoretically and practically. Theoretically, we can all look through that MSAR, the medical school admission requirements, and we can dream about, oh, look at a lovely campus green there. And I love their curriculum and they have all the clubs that I'd want to be in. But if they don't accept you, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> right. So, so there's that piece. The other thing is, you know, numbers don't tell the whole tale. You've probably all heard about holistic review. It's real. It happens. Um, and it's a nuanced difference, but I get asked, how do I stand out? You really don't want to stand out. You want to be an outstanding you, but that doesn't mean you stand out because I can count on one hand the standouts and they weren't people that I really wanted to see in my class. But you want to be outstanding as an individual. And I think it really comes back to motivation. Why are you doing this? Why? How can you move from that cliche, those words on the wall to actions? And if you feel it and you know it, it's a, so much easier to sell it to somebody else. And it becomes a palpable feeling that the interviewer has or that the reader of your statement has when they say, this is somebody we really want to get to know. This is an interesting person. And while we all try to stand out a little bit, you're also trying to fit into the culture of medicine. And, and that's the part, again, this balance between diversity but also fitting into a culture that's existed for millennia, right? Go back to Hippocrates. Um, yet in incremental changes happen. So, so, so there's a lot of theoretical side of it. I think another question that one has to ask oneself of the schools on that list, if I only got accepted to one and were, and were my you know, 20th choice, would I go there? Yes or no. So in other words, do I want to be a doctor or not? Because if you get accepted and try not to go and want to go out on the free market the next year to get somewhere better, that could come back to haunt you. I'm not saying it's not possible, but, but just beware. So that's a lot of theoretical stuff. Now, the practical side is you can't apply to every school and you shouldn't. It's expensive. It's time consuming. You waste a lot of time, talent, and treasure. Um, let geography be part of your guide you know, maybe there are some places you just never saw yourself being. I'm from Ohio. I don't, I don't want to pick on any one state, but there were some places I just never saw myself going. Um, on the other hand, as a general rule, public schools in your state of residence tend to give a little bit more attention to their residents. The flip side is private schools tend to be residency blind, but therefore get so many more applicants. So you're playing that little bit of a game. The part, you know, it, it gets down to, is it about being a doctor or is it about being an Ivy League doctor? Is it about being, you know, a doctor that graduated from my best friend's parents, dog's cousin's alma mater, and that's what matters? Only you know what matters to you. And then, so there's that piece. And then you kind of look at these mission statements because as you alluded to, Michael, some are looking for researchers, some are looking for the leaders of the future, some are looking for primary care doctors, you know, that sometimes the mission helps clarify a little bit, but then I think you have to read between the lines. You know, if this school is in a mega city with four other medical schools, you know 
that they're probably only going to serve a segment of the population, right? Uh, on the other hand, if you're the only school in a more rural area, you might have a wider catchment area. Now, you know, one place might have a huge hospital and a lot more patients, but let's be honest, it's not like you can see every one of them. You only have so much time too. And a lot of it, you know, comes from what you get as you interact with people. I think the, the, the part that I feel saddest about about the virtual interviews is that personal connection. How do you get that gut feeling? You can get it to an extent. I mean, I interview and I have interviewed all sorts of people through the, the, the virtual format and I get a sense for who I really like and who I just like, okay. Um, but I feel bad for the applicants who don't have the experience I have at ferreting that out. Um, and so I hope we get to the point where people can make college visits and medical school visits and see the facilities and see people in action. Because I think that's where you get, like, this is a place I could see myself. So so I don't, does that help? I mean, that's a lot of- Absolutely, that, that's just a lot of information that I'm yeah. sure many, many students um, would have otherwise waited until maybe the, you know, halfway through the application cycle, you know, very late into their, their career um, in undergrad to hear. So I'm really glad that, you know, we, we got that exposure out there. And well, I think if, if you have a trusted advisor, you know, somebody that knows you and can help you navigate, because I, I'll be honest, it's, it's a natural thing to say, my stats line up. You know, my, my, my GPA is above their mean, my MCAT's at their median, I, I fit there. Well, what you don't tell, what you can't see about those numbers, and this is the insider's edge, there are people in that pool that have done post -bac work or graduate work that doesn't enter into the undergrad GPA. There are people who have taken the MCAT more than once. There are people who have, you know, had to like work along side, going to school part-time. You know, think about this. I mean, I don't know where you all are in school. I can tell you five years ago, I don't think Emory Emory student would have had like virtual classes or electronic online coursework on their transcript. And now it's just the way it is. So we're back in person this year, but you know, two years ago when we pivoted to the virtual world, it was a unknown world. I mean, there were, here's another piece, you know, hone your personal skills and interpersonal skills. The guide to really use is right in front of you at the AAMC competencies for an entering medical student. They tell you the kinds of things that schools are looking at with the nuances of, you know, tradition and, and, and circumstances and context, but use these opportunities you have to hone your skills and, and your motivation. I, I, to this day, go back to some of the early reasons I'm doing this now relate to some of the early hints I had that this call to serve and help and learn. I love learning um, be, became so apparent. Yeah. And, and honestly, throughout the whole presentation today, um, your enthusiasm for, for educating has been so apparent. Um, we really love to have you on here. And we're really, really blessed, really honored to have you here. Um, well, thank you. You mentioned that really the whole landscape of admissions has changed. The applicants you would have seen the general application pool you would have seen, you know, 30, 40 years ago is much more different than what we have now. Uh, different things are, are, are put in place, not only for the application process, but also in terms of how they um, operate when you're actually a medical school student. One of those things is the interview. And you mentioned mm -hmm. virtual interviews as being part of that, but outside of just the virtual component, there's also been a shift outside of traditional interviews. So there's things like MMIs mm -hmm. and so many other formats. Um, I'm sure that comes along with different prep, prep work uh, right. to accommodate to that. Can you take us through what you've seen as successful from students going through these different interview formats? Sure. You know, I, I think it's being aware, you know, and not being surprised, but, you know, kind of have to trust the process. Schools will tell you the kinds of things they're going to, to kind of put you through, if you will. Um, I think engaging in life and, and developing humility, you know, humility means being comfortable with who you are, right? Not arrogant to one extreme or not so self-deprecating that woe is me on the other extreme, but really, and that's where that intrapersonal communication competency comes from. Can I self-reflect knowing that, okay, medicine, wouldn't exist if everybody were perfect. That's another one of my rules. 
Nobody would get sick. Who would need a doctor if we were all perfect? So nobody expects perfection. Yet we hope that we can self-reflect and know where our weaknesses are and our strengths and, and, and what to work on, right? And, you know, in, in medical education, we talk a, about, a lot about the F word, feedback, you know? Everybody likes feedback when it's a nice pat on the back, good job. But that constructed feed, constructive feedback is sometimes a bitter pill to swallow. On the other hand, if you build a relationship with somebody that knows you and trusts you, you can provide that feedback and get that feedback in a way that's just much more impactful. I would just leave it at that. So, so I think um, engaging in life helps because as I said, as I started my presentation, it was no accident I said this, I was prepared for tonight. I didn't come in cold, but it wasn't a script. And, you know, I agree, time flew. I was having fun. I would be much more fun if we were sitting in a conference room together, having cookies and, 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 and you know, just some time together. But you've got to do your homework. You've, you've got to be prepared. You've got to think about why you're doing this. I mean, to think that, you know, somebody would feel that the first time somebody's going to ask them, why do you want to be a doctor is at a med school interview is just, you know, that should never be the case. And most of us have had those conversations with ourselves and learning to articulate that and, and not have the elevator speech that's, you know, so polished that it comes across creepy. Hashtag don't be creepy. Um, you, you just have to be natural at it. And, and that's honestly, you look at that log of activities. What was it about maybe being a little nervous First week on campus, you showed up at a club that you thought you'd be interested in. You kept going back. Finally, somebody said, hey, Michael, hey, Mary, hey, Emily, hey, Natalia, would you like bring cookies next week? And you become part of the group. And then the next thing you know, you're being asked to maybe be nominated as an officer. Next thing you know, you're leading the meetings and asking everybody else to bring cookies. That's you know, typically how it ought to happen. Not just, I'm gonna start my own group so I can be a president and therefore show I have a leadership ability. You know, sometimes you just have to show up. And, and by showing up, you then listen to yourself. Do I like this? Is it worth spending my time? Um, and I'll keep going back. Or maybe it's time to cut my losses because this isn't about being a social butterfly and how many things can I put in that log. It's having some meaningful experiences. You know, same way with research. And my campus, I can say for our undergrads who are applying, rule number one, going to just run of the mill medical school, research is not required, period. Yet, many of the undergrads I talk to, by the time I'm signing all those letters, two thirds to three quarters of them have done some research. We're at a research university, it's accessible, it's part of the culture. Is having research helpful? Two words I can answer just about any question with, it depends. You know, if I ask you, tell me about your research and all you can say is, well, I got a paper. I'm the, you know, seventh author out of 22. Well, yeah, good for you. But if you say, you know, it was really hard to find a project, but I finally sent enough emails. Somebody wrote me back and I met with somebody and they hired me in. And it was really frustrating to learn these techniques and I had to learn to manage my time. And I realized, you know, I was two weeks into it and I forgot to add a reagent and the experiments didn't work. And I had to go and tell my PI and, you know, she was a little bit upset with me, but, you know, she let me come back and I learned never to do that again. And then I had to speak in front of the lab and tell them about my results. And, you know, that's a much more compelling story that you got something out of it, right? Rather than just that seventh author paper. So, you know, you can't sit and ponder and reflect on everything. But I think if you start doing that, it becomes second nature. What is it about going to the hospital that energizes me? You know, another, I have a colleague who um, she and her husband met in college. And as they were dating, they were both chemistry majors and pre-meds. They were at a small liberal arts college, not mine, but a, a different one. And they both, because it was a small town, uh, shadowed the same like physician in this town. Her husband, at the time her boyfriend, would come home from these activities and just be jazzed up about she hated it. You know? 
she's just like, ah, how could you do this? He is now a physician and she's an organic chemistry PhD professor. So you have the same experience in the same environment and some people, somebody's attracted to and somebody is just as easily repelled. So you don't know that until you have these experiences. And that's why your advisors and mentors tell you, get the experience. And let's be honest, everybody knows it's been hard to get that experience. Hence, we're having this virtual experience, which is better than nothing. But, uh, but I, my hope is things that have started to open up, we're starting to develop actually a, a, a mentoring or a shadowing program at our institution now. Uh, but, but it's hard. It's hard. And I do know, I mean, I, I just, again, the compassion and empathy. I, I know for many people, my colleagues who just don't want to deal with it, it's like, oh, HIPAA won't let you hear. And, you know, it's just easy to throw up there. That's really not true, <laughs> but, but you have to get credential. You know, I mean, these days you don't want to be walking around the hospital without an ID badge and a reason to be there. So. Well, I think maybe if we could end off on two more questions, we just have a whole list of questions that we would love to go through, but. Um, oh, I know, I know we could talk all night, but honestly, we honestly, have homework to do. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Ashley, uh, a student is asking about, uh, you mentioned research. So about that in terms of duration, um, in general, we understand that duration is something important for not just research, but just all experiences in general. But she's asking specifically about, let's say it's a, a school research project. It was maybe for a few months, a semester, maybe just a month long. Mm -hmm. Would those be wise to still put on an application? You know, I think... My, my view is if you've done this work, you, you should take ownership for it. You know, if you've got a lot of other activities and it was just a tidbit of, of work, that's one thing. But this is where the reflection comes in. What competencies can you say that even in that few months you, you took away from it? Like, okay, maybe it wasn't my be all. Maybe I realized as I reflected on it that I didn't see that this was going to be uh, as valuable to me as you know, working in the community soup kitchen for it, just as an example. When it, I wanted to, I I, I had the experience. I, I I appreciated what it had to offer. It opened my eyes. I might be considering other forms of research in the future. And what I learned was that um, I appreciated working with people more, or or I didn't want to. Um, spend so much time in, in that position because it was taking away from other things that I'd rather do. I, but, you know, on the other hand, if it really was a horrible experience and, you know, all you can say is, you know, I hate it and never want to do this again. I mean, you don't want to be too negative. I think, you know, there's always that try to put a positive spin on things, but I think if you can think about, are there some things on that list of competencies that I can say, and this isn't about tick, tick, ticking the boxes, right? You, hopefully your advisors tell you that this really isn't box checking. This is using these experiences to grow and, and to grow into who you're going to become. And you got to try some things on, you know, that pair of shoes looks really nice, but I try them on and they hurt to walk around in. I'm going to try on a different pair of shoes versus suffer because I like the shoes. And I mean, that sounds so silly, but, it's not that much different than some of these experiences. You feel locked in and uh, let's be honest, you know, we want to finish what we started. That's kind of a, a bit of a trait of many of us who gravitate toward these kinds of fields. But I mean, I've learned, actually I'm in the process of, you see my activities and what my life is like. I've, I'm giving away some committee duties that I, I took on this pediatric clerkship as sort of a favor to my department and um, didn't give up a lot of anything else. And I brought in some teammates, but I also realized, okay, there's some curriculum committee stuff. I'm ready to, I've been doing that for eight years, time to let somebody else learn some skills, so. Just really a wonderful career that, that you're leading and we're so glad to have you um, just share your experience. One more question that we'd love to cover just before we do end, um, shifting away from the application side of things, more to bounce back to your clinical practice Mm -hmm. As someone involved with the pediatric population, how do you take a different approach, you know, just with bedside manner, mm -hmm. being in an environment with children in the hospital compared to older individuals, adolescents? Sure. Well, you know, a, a story I often tell when I, I work with students is, you know, the adage of you never know who's behind door number three. So I could walk into door number one in the clinic or the hospital and I could 
do my best to do a patient-centered interview and look at my patient and make eye contact and ask all my questions to the patient. Now, if that patient is a three-month-old, maybe I'll get a smile or a coup, right? Now, door number two could be the five-year-old, the kindergartner. If you've had any younger siblings or cousins or been around kindergarten, they're fun, fun. That's a fun age, right? They just, they can tell you lots of things. You still need the supporting cast of the parents usually or the guardians to kind of fill in the details, but they'll tell you where it hurts and what makes it better and what makes it worse. Now, if I walk into door number three and it's a 17-year-old, typical 17-year-old, and direct all my questions to mom or dad, my patient's not going to feel very well respected or very involved. So I think as a pediatrician, I have to be not only skilled and facile at doing that, but I have to be willing to jump into that game, right? Because I don't have a script and I have to be like, who's in door, behind door number one might be behind door number three next time, right? It's not like I can memorize it. And, and so to me, that's the, the, the challenge, but the fun of it too, you know? And then, you know, I've always found it kind of fun to, to win over a, a difficult situation, you know, calm the room, bring down the tone. Um, and, and again, I think some of this is having the natural willingness to, to put yourself there while also getting training and, and, and keep your eye on those role models and people you want to emulate. Um, a, a thing that's sometimes hard for people to get around is like, okay, I love the kids. It was just the parents that were a challenge. Yeah, if anybody's ever heard that about Pete's, well, but you know, the, the flip side of that is, what about the elderly parent whose kids are now in the room? asking you all the questions or whose spouse is after you. So, you know, that's part of, part of the role, part of the job. I do think that, um, and this is something that probably became even most clear to me as a clinical researcher who was often uh, recruiting patients from my practice. You've got this duality of, okay, I, that's my subject and I'm the investigator but that's my patient and I'm their doctor <laughs> and we're here to do the study, but patient care remains supreme. So, you know, I have had those situations where, you know, in, if you were like, I'm in the Moderna trial, when I entered the trial, I went in, I read the consent form. I signed my name saying, yes, you can take my blood. You can poke me with needles. If you're a five-year-old or a 12-year-old, or for that matter, even a 17-year-old, you don't get that ability or authority to do true informed consent. The best we get is parental permission and usually what we call assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, like I'll go along with this from the, from the child. And that's similar to, but not exactly the same as the autonomy you have as an adult um, giving permission for yourself. And that's sometimes interesting, you know, like, you know, if, if we're in a clinical study and the patient needs a blood draw, what do you do when the five-year-old says, no, don't poke me. But mom or dad says, yeah, it's okay because they're in the study. Well, you know, it's part of the study. We go through the process and the informed consent process. It's not just a form, but a process. And, you know, it's okay. We're going to do th now if, the person drawing the blood has poked two or three or four times and the child's saying, no, I'm like, we're done here. You know, the child, this is getting to the point of being, so, you know, a lot of it's case by case basis, but, and some of that comes with experience and time. Um, so I, I think that's, that's always a challenge, but you're never expected to do that on your own, especially early in your career. Well, I think that's going to wrap up our session today. That was such a wonderful session. I mean, time flew. Um, the whole 90 minutes that we spent, I mean, it was just fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you for the opportunity. Of course, of course. Just a few last reminders for those listening in. Um, if you're new to the general shadowing format, at the end of each shadowing session, we release a quiz. So that quiz is now released into the chat box, and it's also available on our website if you Go onto our website, click over there, and under the virtual shouting page, you'll see a box um, for this quiz. Click onto there, either over the chat box or on our website, and you'll be able to access the quiz. You can pass it with 60% or above, and it will be due next Wednesday, April 20th at 11.59 p.m. Central Standard Time, as usual. If you have any questions, reach out to us over email. Um, please make sure, though, to put in the email that you'd like to, it to be sent to. 
preferably use uh, personal emails as school emails might direct it to spam. Um, if you don't find it in your inbox, please check your spam folder. Uh, but if you don't find it, either reach out to us. For next week, our next shouting session will be with Dr. Sonia Sloan over orthopedic surgery. Um, so that's going to be another exciting one. It's going to be on Thursday, April 21st at 7 p.m. Central. As always, these are on weekly basis. And we're going to be do that, doing them on Thursdays, as always, 7 p.m. Central. Um, it's getting to that time of year where it's going to be summer. So uh, for those curious, we will be taking a break um, between May and July, uh, full June break, just for the semester break, and then starting up with more sessions in July uh, during the summer and throughout it. Um, so we are glad to have everyone here. We're glad to have you, Dr. Pratiski, here. Honestly, you. if, if you, know, you find more time in your schedule later on this year, we'd love to have you come back and join us. Um, this was such a thrill and so many questions rolled in. We had so many more. So uh, we really do appreciate your time and, and bringing on your expertise here. Thank you again for the invitation. It was a lot of fun. Of course.